Hi, this is Larry Mantle, host of Air Talk on KPCC. Since the start of the coronavirus pandemic, we've had a daily segment on Air Talk devoted to the latest information about COVID-19. As time's gone on, we've looked at vaccines and how the virus and pandemic have affected the lives of Southern Californians. That includes doctors, nurses, epidemiologists, and other medical professionals fighting the virus on the front lines. In each episode of this podcast, we'll speak with one of our experts on the rotating panel of AirTalk guests. They'll be sharing their expertise with us daily. You can also listen anytime at las.com kpecc.org or subscribe wherever you download podcasts. We're joined by Professor of Nursing and Public Health at UCLA, Kristen R. Choi. Professor Choi is also a registered nurse practicing at Gateways Hospital in Echo Park. Professor Choi, great to have you with us again on Air Talk. Hi there, Larry. It's great to be back. Let's begin with the FDA uh, expected to authorize later this week the Pfizer booster for all adults 18 and over. You support that uh, expansion of, of use of it? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's exciting to see this expansion happening. Uh, we've had a, a lot of data coming out of Israel and other places, but kind of like other parts of the pandemic, Israel has really been on the bleeding edge of this, uh, showing that these boosters are safe, but also um, effective at addressing the waning, waning immunity uh, that we know happens with vaccines. And given the levels of spread that we're still seeing in the United States, uh, particularly with the Delta variant, it is exciting to see, um, to see this being reviewed and, and hopefully approval coming forward soon. I, I also wanted to mention that uh, Moderna applied just this morning as well for approval for huh. all adults to get a booster of their vaccine. Uh, and so hopefully soon here we'll have a decision and, and those will be available to everyone who is over the age of 18. Do you think it possible that Moderna, because of some of the concerns, I know it's very rare, but cases of myocarditis in, in younger recipients of that vaccine, particularly males, whether the FDA might give some pause to that. You know, it's certainly something that they will be looking at uh, and looking at very carefully, even though we know that myocarditis uh, is very rare, very, very rare, like one in a million rare. Uh, it is something that they'll look at and take very seriously. And it's possible that approval could come with some more information about that, particularly for groups that we know are affected. Uh, but on the whole, I wouldn't expect too many hiccups to approval for a Moderna booster, as research has shown that it, like Pfizer, is, is quite safe and quite effective. I thought at one time, this goes back maybe a couple months or so, so ago, I can't remember if it's the EU or the UK, um, had recommended against it for um, for men under 30, uh, Moderna. I may have that wrong, but that was, again, because of myocarditis. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and you know, we can think back to, uh, to when the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was paused because of risk of some very rare blood clots. And, uh, you know, I think that as these vaccines are being rolled out and we're thinking about boosters, we are still learning about them and learning about these very very rare uh, events that really we can only see when we're vaccinating millions of people and getting a look at these very rare events. Um, you know, again, I, I don't expect that it will be um, a barrier to approval because these events are, are so rare uh, and so unusual that the, the benefits to everyone in getting them really outweighs the risk of these very rare events. But uh, they certainly will look at it very, very carefully. Well, we welcome your questions for UCLA Professor of Nursing and Public Health, Kristen Choi. We're at 866-893-KPECC. You can ask your question about vaccination, about COVID-19 research, about public health policy. It's wide open related to COVID. 866-893-5722. Please email us with your question at atcomments at kpecc.org. Include your location and your first name, please. Similarly, if you tweet at AirTalk, please include your location and and uh, you can also, if you're on Facebook anyway, you can just leave a message on our Facebook page uh, at AirTalk. Uh, in an interview with Shepard Smith uh, yesterday on CNBC, White House Chief Medical Advisor Dr. Anthony Fauci uh, shared some advice uh, about how best to protect children under the age of five who aren't eligible to be vaccinated. This is a question we get asked a lot. Well, the best way you can protect children who have not yet gotten vaccinated, who are still too young, even below the five-year cutoff. We now 
have authorization and recommendation to vaccinate children 5 to 11 with the Pfizer vaccine, the best way to protect children is to surround them with adults who are vaccinated so that you can feel comfortable and safe in the home with your children and with the rest of your family. Professor Choi, your your thoughts on on what Dr. Fauci said and, and particularly how this factors into Thanksgiving celebrations. Yeah, I think that Dr. Fauci is absolutely right about this. You know, the whole idea of herd immunity, which is a, a technical term that we, we've all been talking about a lot um, in this pandemic, uh, is that, you know, for people who can't be vaccinated because of uh, a medical condition or, uh, in this case, infants who aren't eligible, um, if we can surround them by a herd of people that are vaccinated, the virus is not going to be able to get into that herd, and it's going to protect those people that may not be able to get a vaccine. Um, so what he's talking about is, is exactly right. Uh, the best way to protect uh, children under the age of five and infants is for adults around them to be vaccinated, uh, for siblings to be vaccinated who might be uh, five and older and newly eligible for the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, and really, that's the best way to pre- uh, prevent COVID-19 for, for infants. Uh, the LA Unified School District has announced that for uh, the coming um, 2022, you know, restart of the school year after the break, that there are some changes. Instead, of weekly COVID-19 tests for all students, LAUSD is only going to require unvaccinated kids to continue with regular weekly testing. Also, if a student has had a confirmed exposure, instead of getting sent out of the classroom to quarantine at home, the student can stay in school while wearing a mask in what's going to be called in-school quarantine. The idea being that it's uh, advantageous educationally for the student to be able to stay in the school setting and also that secondary transmission while a student is masked appears to be a a very rare event. Uh, What do you think, Professor Choi? Does it make sense that they would somewhat loosen these requirements for students? Yeah, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic about this plan from LAUSD. Um, you know, I think that the, we've seen their current uh, strategy of uh, testing, requiring vaccinations for teachers and staff, as well as uh, requiring vaccinations for students over the age of 12. Uh, again, cautiously be, be successful so far. And I think there's potential that we can move towards uh, taking some of these steps and scaling back some of these things when it's safe to do so. Kind of like our, our tiered approach to the coronavirus that we've always had in L.A. County, you know, it's important to keep a close eye on things. If we do take steps uh, to lift some restrictions and, and start to uh, have, you know, less testing and, and uh, more more options for kids to resume school as normal, we need to keep a close eye on that and watch uh, numbers of cases and make sure that um, those steps forward are safe. But I think that with that uh, surveillance going on, um, again, I'm cautiously optimistic that we can, we can take these steps forward. Certainly, it's also um, really... Uh, a big, big change and, and a great tool added to our toolkits to have the vaccine available for children ages 5 to 11. Uh, at this time, you know, we, we still certainly, uh, it's a minority of children in that age group that have gotten the vaccine. And we know that there are a lot of parents out there who have concerns about the vaccine for their children. Um, but the safety and efficacy data is very good for the Pfizer vaccine for this age group. Um, and hopefully we'll see more kids uh, in that age group getting this vaccine. One other change Uh, If at least 85 percent of students in a school are fully vaccinated, then those students will not have to mask when they're outdoors anymore once they reach that 85 percent threshold. We'll continue our conversation with Kristen R. Choi, professor of nursing and public health at UCLA. She joins us regularly as one of our terrific core of COVID-19 experts to take your questions. Great chance for you to avail yourself of her expertise at 86. 866-893-KPECC or by emailing us at atcomments at kpecc.org. Uh, we've had a couple of uh, similar questions here. Scarlett in Los Angeles who said she got the Pfizer vaccine in April, then got a breakthrough case of COVID in August, wondering about the timeline. When should she get a booster? Gill in Silver Lake was vaccinated in May, got COVID at the beginning of October, wondering about the timeline to get his booster. Uh, Professor Choi, how long should a person wait after having had COVID before they get the shot? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, for folks who, who have had a breakthrough infection, uh, you know, right now the guidance is still at least six months out from your first dose. So um, I would say as long as they're six months out for that first dose and are past that, that window of having active COVID-19, uh, you're in a good place to go ahead and get that booster. We do know that, you know, having COVID-19 also um, confers immunity and gives your system a boost in some ways. But over time, the majority of evidence that we've seen is that the uh, protection that a vaccine offers is stronger and longer lasting. And so I uh, certainly would recommend that folks go ahead and get that booster, uh, especially once we see it um, authorized for all adults. Heidi in Brentwood asks, how can we feel protected when fully vaccinated people can still get sick and even transmit the disease? Well, Heidi, I don't think there was ever a thought that there would be a vaccine that would be 100 percent effective on keeping people from getting sick. That was never even thought as, as a possibility. The issue was keeping people out of the hospital from getting seriously ill with COVID. And that's where we've seen the huge success in the vaccines. Um, Professor Choi, you want to comment on Heidi's question? Sure. I agree with you, Larry. And, you know, I, I do definitely understand where, where Heidi is coming from. I think that, uh, you know, for a long time, a lot of people had a lot of fear about this virus. And, uh, you know, uh, we thought when we saw how effective vaccines were, I think it's easy to kind of lose sight of the bigger goals here. But you're absolutely right, Larry, that our goal all along has really been to prevent hospitalizations and death. And even though none of us want to get this virus, I don't want to get this virus. You know, getting vaccinated and having a breakthrough case that's mild is a far better outcome uh, than being in the hospital or, or dying from this disease. And so, you know, I think a lot of experts uh, are increasingly uh, projecting that COVID may not go away entirely. We may not be in a situation where there are absolutely zero cases and this virus is not a part of our lives anymore. It's looking more and more like it may be something that we live with for the foreseeable future. And, you know, knowing that, uh, again, um, the, the real goal is to prevent those hospitalizations and deaths. And uh, if you do get the virus and get a breakthrough infection, um, again, knowing that you're still getting protection from the vaccine in terms of keeping you out of the hospital and, and not having very serious illness. Marguerite in Huntington Beach said, after I got my uh, second booster shot, so I'm not quite sure by second booster what she means, but she had, uh, I think she means just second shot. I think that's a misprint. She had a blood clot. Uh, in her brain after getting a second shot. It's now been six months since, so she's hesitant to get a booster. What do you think? Should she be be concerned because she had a blood clot in the brain um, at a time after getting her second dose? Yeah, uh, one of the, um, the the difficult things to suss out when it comes to these vaccines is that uh, we all can have health events that, that happen, and, and sometimes um, we have health events that happen after getting a vaccine that can seem like they're associated with the vaccine, when in fact it, it may have happened whether you got vaccinated or not. And we just sort of see that happen when we're giving vaccines on a very large scale the way that we are now. Um, the risk of, of having a, a blood clot in the brain from these vaccines is extremely extremely low and extremely unusual. Uh, certainly, I think that someone who has this history, it's it's worth talking to your healthcare provider before going ahead. Um, but we, we do often see health conditions come up after vaccination that are not necessarily linked to the vaccine. Uh, it's very unlikely that the vaccine would be the cause of this. Uh, but for people who do have that concern or, or you know, saw things come up after the vaccine, uh, worth chatting with your healthcare provider. Susan in Santa Monica says, since uh, they're saying J&J vaccine, Vaccine recipients should get a booster after just two months. What does that say about the quality of the J&J vaccine in the first place? I received my J&J shot six months ago, and I'm wondering about the effectiveness of it altogether. Yeah, a good, great question. So the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it was uh, when the clinical trials first came out of the vaccine, highly effective at preventing hospitalization and death. Um, a, a bit less effective than Pfizer and Moderna overall, uh, but hospitalization and death, it was absolutely on par with the mRNA vaccines. Uh, as we've seen more research coming out over time at, at a population level, it does look like uh, the vaccines do not 
all confer the same level of uh, immunity and level of protection, but that that protection from hospitalization and death is really quite good for for all of them. So, um, you know, we have learned more about about these vaccines. It seems like the mRNA vaccines offer stronger and longer lasting protection than some of the other vaccines that are out there. Uh, But if you got a Johnson & Johnson vaccine, you know, I think that it's it's fair to still be confident in that vaccine uh, and its protection against hospitalization and death and to consider getting a booster um, just to bring your immunity back up. Same with the other two vaccines. Yeah, because the J&J second shot uh, showed a tremendous effectiveness. And the other thing, is, you know, to keep in mind, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the J&J was originally proposed as a two shot regimen, but but after seeing the effectiveness of the one shot, because that gave so much of an advantage in distribution of it, that's sort of why they went down that road. But it was originally contemplated as as two, was my understanding. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. And, you know, with the Johnson & Johnson, I think it's also important to know that uh, the, the fact that it's one dose is actually a really big deal. And, and that was something that really uh, made a lot of people want to get it or be willing to get it. Uh, a lot of people don't like to get shots, and there are a lot of populations that are hard to reach. For example, people who might be uh, homeless. And when we have a one-dose shot, it's a really important tool. And in this case, because it was so effective with just one dose, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a great vaccine. And uh, as we've learned more that people can benefit from boosters, I think it's great to take advantage of getting a booster. Um, there have been reports about uh, COVID-19 in animals such as minks. We've had we've had mink farms that have had outbreaks of COVID-19. And the latest species to capture the attention of wildlife biologists are white-tailed deer. Um, these are farm deer and end up catching the virus from people. Um, so, you know, the question is, uh, Professor, to what level should we be concerned about the spread back and forth of, of COVID-19 between animals and humans? Yeah, you know, this is a question that has really been um, hard to answer fully uh, throughout the pandemic, understanding what is the relationship between animals and people with this virus, can it spread? And and what we're learning is that it seems like it is spreading uh, in some animal populations quite a lot, um, looking like we have recent evidence that it's spreading quite a lot in deer, as you mentioned, Larry. And, And the concern with the spread is a couple of things. So one is that if it's really spreading unchecked in a population of animals, is it possible for this virus to mutate, to evolve and change and become more infectious or more dangerous? And then is it possible for those changing uh, viral types to spread back to humans? That's the real concern. I think that right now, um, biologists are watching this really closely, um, looking to see if uh, that that kind of back and forth spread is happening. Right now, it doesn't seem like there's evidence of that happening, certainly not in a widespread way, but it is something that they're, they're watching really closely. Um, I also think one other piece that's just important to touch on, I am asked occasionally what people think about their pets, uh, if it's possible that their pets yeah. could get COVID-19 or spread it. Um, and, you know, right now it's kind of the same answer. It's something that experts are, are watching and thinking about. Uh, right now it doesn't appear that there's evidence that this is spread to animal, uh, to pets and back and forth from people to pets, uh, but it's something that is being watched. And, and researchers also have developed uh, some animal vaccines for dogs and cats for COVID-19. But given that we don't really see a lot of evidence of that spread being an issue right now, um, they they have not been uh, really distributed in a widespread way. For hunters, do you think there's any cause for them to be concerned? Yeah, I think it's something certainly to be cautious about. And really, you know, the the best thing that we can do to protect animal populations as well as ourselves is to be vaccinated. So I think that anybody who may be uh, interacting with deer, whether you, you know, have them in in your neighborhood, you're a hunter, anything like that, uh, certainly the best thing you can do is is to be vaccinated yourself. Amir emailed us uh, to ask, said, my wife and I have a disagreement about getting our seven-year-old vaccinated. I want her to be vaccinated, but my wife says, let's wait a couple months, see if any new information comes out. What do I say to help convince my wife to get our daughter vaccinated as soon as possible? 
Yeah, it's a good question. I think I would say that, you know, right now is a really critical time to get kids vaccinated because we are about to go into the winter here. We often see with a lot of uh, viruses and epidemics that there is a seasonal spike in this. And, you know, now in November, when we're about to go into the holidays and about to go into the winter, uh, it's really critical to think about having your kids protected uh, before going into that holiday season uh, and the winter when we'll be interacting with more people as well as being indoors more and there's more potential for the virus to spread. I also think it's worth uh, just taking a look at, at some of the research on this vaccine in kids. Um, again, the, the vaccine was highly effective but also highly safe. And if we think to what we've learned uh, from older kids who have gotten the vaccine in that 12 to 17 range, uh, so far it seems like it's continuing to be very safe and very effective and there's really no um, mechanism that uh, pediatricians or other healthcare providers are concerned about that would affect kids in any way negatively in the long term. So I think given that we are kind of right on the cusp of a lot of increased risk and that we do have such good safety data, uh, it's really good, a good idea to consider getting that vaccine dose now. Hans in South Los Angeles emailed to ask, for those for a, of us traveling for the holiday next week, is it too late to get a booster shot and get some protection? No, absolutely not. Uh, I think it's great to go ahead and get that vaccine uh, before holidays and holiday travel next week. Uh, we, we know, of course, that the, the boosters do take about a week or so uh, to, to kick in and be fully effective, but certainly you can get that process started. Uh, today is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, so I think anyone who is thinking about that before holidays, uh, today is a great day to do it uh, and to get that process started before Thanksgiving here next week. Hal in Anaheim says, I've heard about the recent Pfizer antiviral pill. Would it be okay if people don't get the vaccine but take uh, one of the antivirals when they get sick? Other thing uh, Hal wonders is whether kids would have access to the antiviral pill. Yeah, the antiviral pill is very exciting and, and some really, really promising data looking like this could be a very effective treatment for COVID-19. Um, I, I would say that uh, if you can, though, you really want to get the vaccine rather than have to take a pill to treat COVID. Um, even with this pill, even though it appears to be very effective, uh, there is still some people who may be, be sick. And, you know, you, you really don't know if you'll be one of the people that develops long COVID and, and has ongoing symptoms from this. So even though it's exciting to have an effective treatment, uh, it's always better to prevent a disease rather than to treat it. Uh, just keep yourself healthy in that way. So certainly would still recommend getting the vaccine, even knowing that we have an effective treatment for, for COVID. Stephen in Hollywood emails us, how much time should I allow between getting a flu shot and the COVID-19 booster? Uh, there, you are, you're okay to get those both at the same time. Uh, can make an appointment to get them both at once, and, and there's really no need uh, to wait in between uh, the flu shot and the COVID booster. All right, 866-893-KPECC. Uh, we have Stella in Santa Monica emailed us uh, about what the chances are of getting long-haul COVID for someone who is uh, fully vaxxed and boosted. Yeah, we still don't have a lot of good data on this. Uh, there are studies going on, a lot of them looking at long COVID and, and who is at risk and uh, what happens there. But unfortunately, we don't have very much data yet for this among people who are vaccinated. Um, I would suspect that, you know, the likelihood is lower given that people who are vaccinated, if they do contract COVID, it's generally much, much more mild and, and shorter lived. Um, but that's something that we'll, we'll have to sort of wait for data to see um, to see what the risk is there and how it compares to folks who are not vaccinated. All right. Uh, I think I have time for one more question here. Uh, let's see. Um, Marcy in Los Feliz emailed, if, if someone has a son who will be five beginning in January, what would you think about stretching the truth a little to get um, the child vaccinated to be safer during the holidays and winter months? Yeah, that, that's a difficult question. I, I think that's something you can talk to your uh, pediatrician about. Uh, there have been cases of, of people um, giving the vaccines um, outside of those age ranges in certain cases. But I, I would say that overall, the guidance from the CDC, as well as from uh, the American Academy the, uh, Academy of Pediatrics uh, is to wait uh, until until um, it's officially approved and we know that it's safe for that age group. And, you know, by making sure that adults around your 
child are vaccinated, uh, you, you know, you can really um, be assured that they are likely to be protected if they are surrounded by a herd of adults who are vaccinated. Jacob in Mount Washington said, I had a harsh reaction to the second Moderna shot, pretty much bedridden for a few days. Can I expect the same from the booster? Uh, Jacob, just want to say the booster is half of the dose for me. My booster was less of a reaction than I had from the second. But uh, I assume, uh, Professor Choi, it's, it's impossible to say for certain how someone responds. Hard to say for sure. It can be different for each one. But like you, Larry, my booster dose was much less than the second. So yeah. I, I hope that that's the case. So, yeah, and you would be getting uh, almost certainly half the dose in your booster of Moderna. Thank you, Professor Choi. So good to have you with us, as always. We appreciate it. Thank you, Larry. Kristen R. Choi, Professor of Nursing and Public Health at UCLA. Thanks for listening to this episode of COVID in L.A. If you'd like to stay up to date with the latest coronavirus news, you can listen anytime at las.com, at kpecc.org, or subscribe wherever you download podcasts. See you next time and stay safe. I'm Larry Mantle. 